because she was getting in her own head. She was complicating the process and she was mentally still dieting. And that is their thing. She was never this bad before to the point where it affected her sex life. It affected her libido. It affected everything to the point where she lost herself. And this mm. is like, you need to be willing to pace yourself and not want it all now because all the things we spoke about, like actually developing all these tools and becoming like a badass, it doesn't happen overnight. You need to be willing to put in that work and like the whole levels thing. And because that's what I wanted to talk about after all that, <laughs> because you mentioned the stuff that you do with your clients in the gym. And yes, I'm going back to there because that's where I wanted to talk about this. But yeah. We were talking about the way that she approaches her clients in the gym with the eating habits. And we'll dig into that a little bit more as well. But it's the same with me, with my clients, except the fact that it depends on what they're willing and what they're able to do. And that's the same with you comparing yourself to other people and their bodies. It's like, yeah, but what are they doing right now? And what are you willing and able to do about what they're doing right now? And I heard on another podcast, I'll come back to that food thing. I heard on another podcast, they said something like, you can't just wish for someone's body without wishing for everything else that comes with it, which might with be it. Quite yeah, it yeah, might be all those broken things in their life. I think we had that with you at one point too. Like I remember you saying, like we had another client. You're like, oh my god, her ass. Like I want her ass, and I was like, yeah, but you wouldn't want what come like like the body fat levels that come with that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what Luke always used to say to me. Like, oh, this is going to be another thing to talk about. Body fat does happen with muscle gain. Let's talk about that as well later. Because I put this in my stories the other day, which I will talk about after I talk about this food thing. So when clients come to me, the first thing they do now is they go through an introduction week. And the first task on that is a food, a four-day food diary in chronometer. I mean, mm-hmm. my fitness pal, because my fitness yeah. pal, I can like look into it. So they do that, but... Obviously, they're not tracking every single little thing they put in there, but it gives me an idea. And then I compare that to their initial questionnaire, which has a lot of detail into all the different types of foods they like, don't like, and what they ate the day before. So they have that. But then if they can't do the My Fitness Pal and they're a busy mum and they can't be fogged, food photos, that's what I get. Yeah. We have the tools for you, but you need to speak out and not just push your way through something that isn't working. And then- yeah. Once they get that, I actually give a food template and the food template is flexible unless they already know how to use my fitness pal. And then this is where the communication comes in. You will have that food template as a food template without any changes unless you need macro changes or unless you complain about something in your check-in and I might tweak something small, but I won't really change the whole thing. Overhaul it, yeah. Food is food. Like food is food. You can change up little things here and there, but you don't need to overhaul everything all the time. But back to the point, it's, it is there as a template. And until you are ready to advance and you're, you ask for more, then we can put you onto my fitness pal the same way, which is why you go through intro week. And the first step is literally slowing the fuck down and just eating the same as you were, but now logging it into my fitness pal. Yeah. So you start to be, get better at tracking, at using because there's no yeah. point going from, okay, I'm going to do all this and then change every single diet and then, oh, I can track this now. Oh, I can track this now. No, you need to do the learning steps along the way. And then once you do that, then you can start subbing a little meal here and a little meal there until you become more competent at it. And yeah. like comp- you, you become competent without even realizing. And before you know it, you're intuitively eating, which you're not really intuitively eating. You're just able to navigate your food. Make an educated decisions. Yeah. Um, and I think the theme of this whole entire chat has just been like small incremental changes and building habits over a longer period of time, as opposed to just like a short burst of complete change. <laughs> Cause it's, you want to think about it as the long game. Like you want to think about, can I do this for the rest of my life? Because I think, and look, do you know what? I understand how the industry has gotten to the point where it has, where you've got these like eight week challenges, six week challenges, 10 day yeah. challenges. I understand because, and, and, and also I understand how it's gotten to the marketing of like weight loss shakes and meal replacements and stuff like that. And the reason is they're just targeting people's inherent laziness and what, and want for instant 
gratification without putting in any work. And so they're really targeting those desires within people. But at the, at this industry is the wrong industry to do that because unfortunately what's going to work and what's going to stick is the opposite of weight loss shakes and challenges. It's the long-term habits creating like a, something sustainable you can do forever that you enjoy that works for you um, and just small changes along the way. There's still so much to talk about here that we need to go back to as well, but so much you just said there as well. It's like before all of that as well, it's you deal a lot with people that come to you like that, but that, that's the whole premise of like muscle nerds and why I invested so much into them because so much, yeah. the first thing I ever did, oh, we're going to have to come back to this. Okay. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the body fat thing as well. It's I put this in my stories the other day. It's like, you need to be okay with the fact that body fat is going to happen when you're on a process to building muscle. And that's something that people are not willing to like take on board. They're fearful of it. And I get it because I was there, but it comes a point where you are so fearful of it that you will never, ever, 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 ever see changes in your body without being okay with that fact. So I might let you talk about that before we come back to that one. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And there's not really a lot more to it than that, except the, I mean, the first off, you've just got to start questioning five whys. Why are you scared of body fat? It's essentially just going to come down because we've been conditioned to from fucking social media. Like social media is so good, but it's also so bad. And you're just probably comparing yourself to the, to the people that are, it, like I think you said in one of your chats that you did on social media the other day, like you're comparing to your level one or 0.5 to someone else's level five. Um, and it's just like, you can, you can have some control over how much body fat you put on in a bulk, but you'd have to do it really fucking slowly. And it's either like, you have to decide what you want, to, what you want the like the least like do you if you want the if you want it quick then you're going to have to be okay with yeah putting on some size some fat some size everywhere if you want if you want to avoid that the most then you're going to have to be okay with doing it in a lot longer and slower um right, so the other thing is if you are complaining so much about the fact that you don't have toned legs you don't have legs like ruby you don't have a butt like krista you don't have these bodies like other people it's like you do realize that it actually takes building some muscle and the fact that you keep complaining as soon as your pants get tight, like mm. they're, like you can't confine yourself to the same size clothes either because it, like even when you're building muscle, that comes with water weight. That comes with like size. Mm. It takes up space. It's like if mm. you physically look at the glutes, I can't even do this thing. Let's do it this way. It's like your zoom out thing though, right? Like just like, zoom out because overall- like this, you want this, but you don't want extra weight. Like what's that get yeah. away once you get that? It's like, yeah. it's the same concept, but yeah, you actually watch the trust the process one, but that's the thing. Yeah. I just think, I just think you have to, um, uh, what was I going to say to that? Be realistic oh about where you're starting and. Yeah. And I get, I get, sorry. That's what I was going to say. I just think you really have to question why you don't want something and why you do like the five whys just dig five layers deeper and see like what what is your fear around body fat percentage what is your fear around scale weight change like why yeah. does it bother you is it does it is it just because you've been told that it's a bad thing because it's not that's like it really isn't and it's not your self-worth like I saw something really good the other day and it's like your scale your weight is the least interesting thing about you really is like you don't even know it what really I really is you also another thing like I did a chat on my stories maybe a year or so, or so ago and I was thinking like if you think about all of the reasons that you have people in your life like the people you choose to be in your life and that you choose to be friends with that you choose to be partners with that you choose to work with if you think about all of the reasons like think of every single person in your life and think of the reason as to why you're friends with them or you have them in your life not one of them is because they weigh a certain weight not one of them is because they have a certain body fat percentage. It's because of how they make you feel. It's because that you trust them. You find them loyal. You like their sense of humor. They're good people. It's nothing is because of how they look. Um, and why do we feel like, why do we put that pressure on ourselves 
when you don't put it on anybody else? Like, why do you think other people are going to judge you from your, your weight or your appearance when you don't judge anyone else by their weight or appearance? And they don't either. Like literally no one decides to be your friend because you have low body fat percentage or because you weigh a certain weight, not one fucking person. And it blows my mind that people still put so much emphasis on it. And body fat percentage is a really stupid thing to go by anyway. Like if you think about it, one, how inaccurate it is. And two, yeah. it looks different on every On everybody. Other. Everyone holds fat differently. Absolutely. Um, and then when you think about what a body fat percentage actually is, it's a ratio, right? Like you take your total your total um, amount of what makes you up like matter and you divide it into what's fat and what's not fat. And say, say you weigh uh, for argument's sake, 50 kilos and your body, your body fat percentage is 20%. So that's what 10 kilos of fat you can put on 20 kilos of muscle and keep the fat the same amount. Um, so you don't even change your fat, the amount of fat you have. You now weigh 70 kilos and you have, and only 10 kilos of that is fat. So what's that like 12 or 13% body fat? So you've reduced your body fat percentage, but you have not dropped any fat whatsoever. And you've reduced your percentage because you've changed the ratio of what's not fat. Does that make any sense at all? I'm not too sure. Yeah, but it's, it's like, all, yeah, all body fat percentage is what's fat, what's not fat. And if you if you drastically increase what's not fat, you're dropping your body fat percentage without even dropping body fat. So I don't know why people put emphasis on that either. So That's how like, you get toned and sculpted legs because toned and sculpted legs and toned and sculpted anything is mm. literally the density of your body, like having more muscle to fat ratio. And I'm going to read something that Ali put up because I loved it and I only just saw it yesterday because I was trying to stalk her posts. It's um, she got a DEXA scan just to see what people actually think her body fat percentage is. And many people think that they are much lower than they are, but then there are people oh, who think they're much higher than they are. And the thing is, why does it really matter what your body fat percentage is when you want a particular look? So, yeah. and something I used to say when I was competing on stage is when I was doing comp prep, I should say, when I was comp prepping girls, it's, does it really matter what you weigh on stage? Are they going to judge you first, second, third based on your scale weight? Are they going to judge you first, second, first base, first, second, third based on how much you lift? Are they going to get you a barbell and see if you lift the most? Like you're doing things out of a, I want to look a certain way and there is something deeper than that and that's why I don't do the five whys I dig into the hows how yeah. do I feel what does that mean to you because there is so much more under the surface and if you actually get really clear on what something means to you and how you want to feel it becomes a lot easier to let go of just the goal and focus on the process because then it's just like my gut health is better I'm digesting I'm pooping we can talk about poop with the blood pressure too. But going back to the things, the thing that we wanted to talk about when it's not about the food, that was the very first thing that I ever did in terms of my education. Oh, really? Yeah. Was it? It's a deep, that's a deep opening. It is. Maybe you can talk about that without me going into it because you can start that conversation. Um, yeah. So we used to hold a seminar called When It's Not About the Food. And we used to team up with a counselor, um, an EMDR therapist from New Zealand. And they used to specialize. It was a husband and wife cop team. And he used to be an award winning chef in New Zealand for about 30 years. And then he became a personal trainer. And she's a uh, counselor and uh, does EMDR therapy, which is uh, eye movement, EMDR eye movement something desensitization I don't know anyway the premise being so we, when you process emotions or or uh, when you process memories and events from the day is that typically happens in your uh, REM stage of sleep so your rapid eye movement stage of sleep and the premise is moving from left to right from your brain so that's why your eyes move the way they do in that stage of sleep is because that's when you're processing all your stuff if something traumatic happens it doesn't process it stays in the wrong part of the brain and you it's all subconscious conscious unconscious and you kind of self-sabotage yourself and you've got all these things and you make all of these decisions in your life based on this unprocessed trauma and emdr therapy is processing that back into the right part of the brain like the memory storage part as opposed to keeping it almost like live anyway the premise of it is um 
uh, most people, I think the statistics are 70 to 75% of or obese or overweight. I think it's obese people have had some type of childhood trauma or trauma in their life. So one of the biggest eye openers for me was when she said that uh, we have this habit, the industry has this habit of looking at obese people and overweight people and saying, hey, you have a problem we have the solution, come to us and we will fix your problem. The problem with that is the people who are obese and overweight, more often than not, their size is a solution to something. It is a solution. It is keeping them safe from something, whether that is sexual abuse, physical abuse, any type of like, you know, they've put on, had to put on a gorilla suit for whatever reason. Um, and so we need to approach it from a, a softer, more empathetic perspective and the whole point of the course though was not for trainers to obviously fix that it was to see your red flags to assess when there's red flags and to know when to be able to refer out because this person is needs needs a big identity shift what served them as their coping mechanisms and their survival mechanisms throughout their childhood or growing up no longer serves them, but they're still the mechanisms that they're using. They're now detrimental to them. So there's so much more to it than not about the food. Like you can give them the perfect diet. It's not just as simple as saying just eat healthy or just exercise because it's up here that they're battling with. It's, you know, they don't want to be their size, but their size is saving them from something. It is it is a solution to something for them. Um, and they need to be able to work through that and work past that. So that was the premise of the When It's Not About the Food seminar. Yeah, and on that note, this is why coaching isn't about what you eat. It's not about how you train. It's a lot deeper than that. So if you want things to stick, you need to actually, like the reason that this whole topic here is so important is so you realize that as well. And this is something that I've been helping, like I have a very recent win lately with one of my girls is like food to her was a means of not feeling lonely. It was a means of like, it, it was a means to an end for something, but I know that you talked about it in terms of habits, not creating goals, but it's like, yeah, but it's sometimes it's not even just about the habits. It's about creating the environment so that you're not actually forcing the habits. You need to make it easy to do that habit. Like shift your environment. If you're eating in like the kitchen for dinner, why don't we take the dinner outside and eat it outside so that you don't have the same cues? It's like, there are things you can change, but at the same time with what you mentioned about the whole food thing, it's not minusing, it's adding things in as like, it can serve as a distraction. It can serve as a replacement by adding stuff in like, Instead of watching TV at night or instead of doing this at night, why don't we actually have you coloring in? Why don't we change it to something that you do that's spending time with yourself? Where is that lacking? And I find with a lot of my girls, it's actually the fact that they don't ever put themselves first. They don't. Yeah, that's a really bad female trait too, actually, is uh, they're altruists. They, they light themselves on fire for everybody else. Um, and again, like, where does that come from? Like, why do we feel like we have to be everything to everyone? Like, why are we so hesitant to let people down or, or put ourselves first? Or why do we get that guilt if we say no to people? Um, it's just, it's so deeply ingrained in a lot of females and males as well, but you see it more so on females because um, that expectation of like nurturing is there for a, for a lot of females, that expectation of like being the carer, the look after, uh, you know, you, you build the home. Um, and yeah, it, 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 they, they won't put themselves first. And that means it's that you won't really have hard. They get, anymore. they get guilt. They get guilt if they do. Yeah. And where then, does that guilt come from? Yeah. Like what, what are you afraid of? Why do you need to keep doing mm. this for other people? Is it because you won't feel good enough? But the thing is, how are you allowing yourself room to be good enough if you're mm. feeling shit all the time? If you're yeah. emotionally drained all the time? Like I was feeling, well, it's not really good for me as an example, but maybe you might think of a client as well. But I was putting all my time into hating my waist because my waist is blocky, but yeah. now it's just a part of me. It's like I put so much time into focusing on all these things I can't do and all these things I hate about but, and And, and the things that you can't necessarily change, like your ratios are your ratios. You know what I mean? Like, what are you going to go and do? Get fucking, I don't know. Rib rib what are you going to do? Rib rib yeah, rib like, let's stretch you out. You know what I mean? Like, but then when you but think then, and, like, and, the, and the 
flip side to that though is like your your mechanics your biomechanics like you're the perfect body to be strong as fuck and you are like that's cool start, and it's funny. that amplify your strengths versus just focusing yeah. on your weaknesses yeah absolutely see be appreciative of what your body can do and the thing is you're always gonna want what you don't or can't have always like you get someone that's got a nice elongated waist that you admire and they're gonna be like fuck i would love to be able to deadlift 187 kilos and it's like, you know what I mean? Like, man, I wish, I wish I had that physique and it's going to be someone who's got naturally more muscle mass than someone who's leaner. Like I look at girls that have that put on, you know, put on muscle easily. And I'm like, man, that's an attractive look, but it's because they're not, they don't have the same physique as me. Like I don't look at many girls that have the same shape as me. And I think it's attractive. And it's just because you can do, do what you've got is normal to you. You always want what you can't have. You find beauty in things that aren't you. And it's fucked up. Like, I love that. It's true yeah. you mentioned. It's like you see, that's the thing. Like you see yourself all the time. So you're never ever actually realizing how much you change in that period of you're time. You're so desensitized to yourself. Yeah. But the other thing is going back to what this whole thing is about, and well, not really the whole thing is about, but part of what this is about is when you actually realize why you're doing what you're doing and actually focus on the process and make that the goal you find it harder to feel like you're less than because everything you're doing is for you and you're realizing how much it's benefiting all these other areas of your life. And you realize now that you are being a better mom because you're doing all these other things. And we talk about identity a lot. And it's like, you can't identify as a mom. Yeah, you have kids, yeah. but there is so much more to you. And if all you do is just give for your kids, you're really not giving them anything because they learn from you and it affects oh. generations to come. A really good saying that I saw that I liked, and I've shared it a couple of times on our, in our content is putting other people first tells them that you come second. And I like that because it's just like, yeah, if you just, if all you do is, and this is what my problem is, I just, I'm a very much a people pleaser and it's not a good trait to have in some instances. Um, but if you just put everyone else's needs first, you are teaching them that your needs don't matter and they come second. So just by default, they become desensitized and their new normal is like, oh, okay, well, I'll be looked after before the business or before you or before our relationship or you know whatever and it just, and it's and it's a subconscious thing it's it's you know you just set that precedent that you will always sacrifice and it becomes expected of you and that's why you get into that trouble of being able like not being able to say no because you always said yes and it's like if you say no it's like what and you're a fucking dick you know they're like oh my god i can't believe you just said no like it's it's really it's yeah if you put other people first it tells them that you come second and you shouldn't come second no one should come second like you got to do what's right for you you got to look out for number one even if that means disappointing some people like their disappointment is not yours to own or wear like obviously don't treat people like shit um like don't go out of your way to be dicks but you do have to put yourself first and if you have to say no to some people and some things like they'll be okay they can figure it out it's not your responsibility to make other people's lives easier that's their responsibility i love that so much because it's it's touching on the fact that if you really don't look internally and see what it is that your approach right now is impacting physically emotionally socially you're going to keep burning the gas out and mm. you get to a point where like i have a i have a example of a client who's a spotify premium and they're yeah. part of a little they're part of a little group chat because i have like a couple of group chats with people that can like help each other out but yeah. two of the girls in that group chat have become spotify premium and two of the others are still like trying to grab onto things but it, I had the conversation with her outside of the chat I'm like you do realize how far you've come by reading what that other person just said and she's like holy shit yeah because mm -hmm. that whole like putting each other first and then you, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like I wish I was still here and you're looking back to old versions of you you're complaining on social media all the time and you're you're creating the perfect environment for feeling like absolute shit and yeah. it just feeds itself and if all you're going to do is just, I guess, if all you're going to do is wish for things, but not actually take the actions to do them, you're never going to build confidence or feel capable of doing things because confidence comes from doing what you said you would do. If you keep putting your word on the back burner, 
you are never going to believe in yourself. You are never going to trust your body. And if you failed in the past, I might put this post up today and I'm going to tag you in it because I wrote it. I actually wrote it this morning. But if you put all your worth on your past failures and you don't realize that there is actually better out there, you maybe just had a bad experience, you are never going to allow yourself to be your best to see all there is out there and to actually live your best, to give to those that you love, that you want to put first, because they're not really coming first if you're always last. Because Yeah, 100%. You're like and the thing, yeah, and the thing is, though, like, if you've got the self-belief that, like, you're a piece of shit or that you're lazy or that you're a person that never gets anything finished or that you're a person that puts other people first or whatever – all you're going to do is act in a way and and that validates that belief and that you're going to look for confirmation that confirms that belief and you're going to ignore anything else that disputes it or says otherwise. So like if you're a person like uh, if you identify as someone who like, oh man, I never finish anything and there's like little like it's do you know what a really good example well, it's not really a good example but we had a we had someone leave like a bad review on us on our social media like or on our business page um a few years ago they left like a one-star review and just said that we're not good at what we do and all this sort of shit and um i ended up contacting her and i was because it was a it was a co- client of one of our coaches and i looked through her entire time of working with him and she had come to us and she wanted to get her period back. She wanted like her goals in order where I think get her cycle back, um, get, I can't really like get healthier. And then her final goal was to lean out. So we literally like, she got her period back. She got, um, her sleep was better. Her moods improved and her check in form. She was confirming all these things and she was solely focusing. So this is like your zoom in and zoom out thing. She was solely focusing on, on weight loss. And the problem was like to address her health issues, she had to put on a little bit of weight and it was like two kilos. It was fuck all really, um, compared to like, obviously what it was. So we were worked on all the things she said she wanted and she achieved those, but because she couldn't stop focusing on the weight loss stuff and because that was to come like we were literally just about we'd gotten some health stuff in order we're literally just about to start like a cup a cup for her so she could drop some body fat um but she disregarded all of the things she had achieved and all of the wins she had had because she was focusing on what she hadn't. And it just blew my mind. I was like, how do you not see, like we literally, first off, we gave you what you after you, you achieved all these things. This is all the progress you've made. You've made 10 progress things and one thing you haven't done, but you're focusing on that one that you can't see the 10. And people do that all the time. I love that. Like my, my philosophy on this is obviously different than yours, but this is why I say fuck the scale because yeah. there comes a time where you are just like, you start with good intentions like she did. This is mm. why I like client examples. Client examples are so relatable for people listening to this because you start off with great intentions. And then as soon as you get so focused on that scale number going down, I see with like friggin' apparently because of slimming world or whatever it is, because you're always so focused on the number going down as soon as you get to the finish line or wherever it is, you don't know anything different. And then you mm. become so warped into the scales that nothing else matters. No other progress marker is seen. It's you need yeah. to redefine your meaning of progress because yeah. your goalposts will always shift and you need to tune into that, but also be realistic. You don't want to lose yourself in the process. And this brought me back to the first note that I made that I wanted to talk about with your talking is you need to find things outside of the gym so that your gym isn't your only source of happiness because that is when it gets really hard to enjoy the process. Yeah, and like, I mean, your life is so multifaceted, there's so many aspects to your life and all of them you have to like or enjoy, well, not all of them you have to like and enjoy because there's some things like housework, you're never going to like and enjoy that. Um, but I remember what got me, actually what got me to meet, meet, meeting Luke in the first place and what got me into just like, I guess the education and continuing education side of the industry is I remember when I was training clients and I was like, surely there's more 
to the to them getting the results they are after than the 45 minutes a day that I see them like what about the other 23 minutes and 23 hours and 15 minutes like what are they doing in in that time um and that's where it started me on the education journey and like trying to learn more about how the body works and learn more about sleep and habits and lifestyle and how that interplays because you have 45 minutes a day with someone not even a day 45 minutes three times a week like you have to find stuff outside of that that's going to be conducive to where you want to go as well and like what is that what does it look like where are you now where do you want to be it's different for everybody and it's not just the training that you have to focus on it's just like it's your thoughts it's your beliefs it's your outlooks it's your habits it's your sleep you know everything has to be kind of looked at and addressed and like monitored and managed as much as possible yeah and that's the other thing as well because this is where we go into the habits because it it takes a while to create a structure that serves you and we were talking about the the nighttime routine and I'm sure that you have the same morning routine every morning and if it's not the same it's going to be something similar or it's just because you have something on but the thing is what you do most of the time is what you gravitate towards when life Mm -hmm. gets chaotic so yeah yep that's a really good thing as well we spoke about that it's like when you are stressed your default is what your habits are when you are not stressed so that's why you have to work on stress management techniques and habits and all those sorts of things that serve you when you're in a good place because they're what you're going to fall back on when you're not in a good place um but there's just it's just it can appear overwhelming to people because you're like oh my god I have to like address all of these different aspects of my life like how overwhelming like I don't want to do that but it's it doesn't have to be it's just all these small little things and like your morning routine starts at night the night before so it's just like what can you control what are you willing to do let's start there and then we will it's it's a long process yeah that's the thing it's overwhelming if you're trying to do it all at once and Mm. like like I said in that video that I sent you it's you're not just going to have to figure out how to do all the things the next day because you don't just wake up at your bowl like you become that person in the process and that's what a lot of people miss out it's like what if I fail or it's the fear of success it's like you don't just fall into success you work hard to get there and in the process you learn how to do the things and then you learn how to cope with all these other things but then something you said kind of ties back to the not not everyone can start off with fat loss because you don't have the stress management in place if you don't this is something that I actually did learn from the business little unit you had in there is yep. if you can't raise your ceiling, raise your floor. And if you yeah. can't raise your floor, then you're going to keep falling to the old habits that you ever had. And this is another saying of mine. I put this in like a million posts by now. It's your default settings are bullshit. So yeah. you need to upgrade the hardware before you worry about fancy apps, before you worry about how your phone functions or what your phone does, like you need to pick the default settings because if something happens or you break your phone and then you get a new phone, the default settings there are bullshit if you haven't yet upgraded them. Like you need to actually work on your hardware. And this is kind of ties into the really other big topic, which is it's about a calorie deficit, not a nutrient deficit. And the reason why this all ties into it is because if you're not actually getting in your protein, for example, like people do not eat enough protein. That can be one for you as well. People do not get in enough veggies that have the vitamins needed to have a healthy metabolism. And this is something really, really important that I really want to talk about because not only does it impact your ability to build muscle and burn fat, but it impacts your brain. Because like if you're not eating the right foods, then your mood's going to be shit you're going to feel sluggish. You're not going to be wanting to move more because now your gut is not allowing you to poop and then you feel all backed up and then you're like, I don't want to go to the gym because I can't poop. It's it's all tied. It's all like it's yeah. all tied together. And this is why it is not just about the scale. Mm. I mean, I think there's definitely like a large emphasis on calories, 100%, because at the end of the day, fat loss comes from a calorie deficit. It's correct it's also um oversimplified i mean it's it's not oversimplified it is that simple it's as simple as that the difficulty comes with like i think i mentioned it earlier the reason that you eat isn't like solely related to your physique like your the purpose of food is to keep you 
functioning. It's to keep you alive. But when we look at it through that single straw and that single fact of just like fat loss, you then disregard all the other things that food is needed for. And a calorie deficit shouldn't be a nutrient deficit. And what that means is like I every single process in the body is fueled by like a vitamin or mineral you have like you have nutrient dependent cofactors and nutrient dependent receptors and nutrient dependent um if like conversions and enzymes so everything like that has to be converted in your body is reliant on a mineral or a vitamin or or something and if you don't have enough of them like say you need and and this i get this from this example from dr libby and she's really good say you need um substance x needs to be turned into substance y like you have that that conversion has to happen for you to function um, or for, su for some really important process to work. But for substance X to convert to substance Y, it, it needs to have substance Z. If you don't get enough substance Z in your diet, it's going to find substance Z from somewhere else that it is in the body and that'll cause deficiencies and all over the place. If you then don't get enough substance Z, substance X won't convert to substance Y and you'll get twofold problems. Not only will you not have enough substance Y, you will have too much substance X and that can cause its own issues. I so nutrients are so health. important. Something go. Health, just so you can continue on that path. This kind of might work with blood pressure, but that will be later on. Um, very soon. Blood markers, when you get your blood tests, that thing that is shown on your blood test is not the thing that's wrong. That is the thing that is showing up because something else is wrong in the system. And that's the same with this. Like you will deplete from other areas and your body will take from other areas because you're not giving it something else in a different area. So then if you address this, you'll probably down the road will make the whole issue worse because you're still taking from this in the long run. Mm. yeah i mean you're like i as from what i understand i don't i don't interpret labs um it's not i'm still learning that in school um that's a that's a luke lehman category but from what i understand is whenever you get your labs all that is is a snapshot of of what has been going on um it's like a, it's like almost like a history of everything and you can't just look at your blood work and look at the ratios as, as a standalone figures and being like in range in range in range you have to look at ratios between certain things you have to look at different patterns amongst things you have to have an understanding of like what happens within and most doctors will be like yep you're in range with everything but even then the ranges come from the averages of um blood tests that have been done over decades or whatever but how many healthy people go and get blood tests those ranges aren't from healthy optimal people and everyone has their own optimal range and no one knows what that is because nobody goes to the doctor and says i'm feeling fucking fantastic run me my labs like nobody does that and also even if you did the doctor wouldn't give it anyway so you don't know what your optimal levels are because you don't test and when you're feeling the best i'm going to tie this back to the importance of having a coach because this is actually really important what zoe just said there is really important and this is why you need to freaking do your feedback and not just say it's good like you need to speak up for a lot of things because everything that you put in metrics like whatever it is that you are willing to put into our metrics which i wish most of my clients actually filled out the damn metrics because it's so important and you're going to explain why but it's like those metrics mean nothing the sleep data on your watch means nothing without context because what looks good on paper might have you feeling shit and what looks shit yeah. on paper, you might actually feel good at. So it's relative to you. And because you said this really well as well, it's it's a snapshot in time of what you were doing before. And I know Luke mentioned this before. I don't know the intricacies, but it's almost like when people just give you an estrogen blocker because your estrogen is high on blood tests. But the thing is, the estrogen why is it high in the first place. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, yeah. why is it high? Yeah. And I mean, he talks about that with glucose disposal agents as well. So what a lot of people will do is be like, oh my God, I'm not like, I'm not utilizing, I'm not getting glucose into the cell. I'm going to get a glucose disposal agent and I'm going to force that in there. You know, you have to ask the question, why does your cells not want it in the first place and address that instead of forcing the body into something. And this is the thing I spoke about this. Uh, we don't speak about it somewhere. Oh, I can't remember. 
it might have been on a podcast and they um we spoke about the difference between like conventional medicine like westernized medicine and then uh, alternative medicine and like what the differences were and it's almost like the medications and pharmaceuticals and stuff and the drugs that are created fantastic they save lives 100 percent. they force the body to do certain things right they they're like okay you've got something that's not working take this and it's going to force it's going to force your body into it whereas like the alternative medicine is more like let's coax your body into wanting to do the right thing on its own Um, each have a place say that again force versus facilitate yeah and so it's like each has a place each has a time each is and they're both a both got been like pros, both got cons. And that's the thing. Everything's got pros. Everything's got cons. You've got to learn the pros and cons of everything. So you know when to use it and when to not, and when it's suitable, when it's not. Um, and then another example of that is like cortisol. Everybody demonizes cortisol. Everybody says, oh, you know, you got to get your cortisol down. You got to get your cortisol down. But cortisol is high for a reason and it's trying to protect you. It's just doing its job. You've got to find out why it's high and give it a reason itself not to be high instead of trying to force it down yourself. Because um, all you're doing then is treating the symptoms and not the cause cortisol is actually anti-inflammatory so it's actually that's why it, that's yeah thing in your body if it's high because obviously there is something going wrong if it's high i mean it's trying to make you anti-inflammatory da, da, da. it's like the stages of stress right it's like you have your acute stress response which is when your adrenaline and your neuroadrenaline spike and you're supposed to then once that happens like you're it's 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 instant survival that's the purpose of it it's like let's get you out of the situation that you're in danger with right now if that stays elevated for too long, that's when cortisol comes along and suppresses it and, and it does the anti-inflammatory and all that sort of stuff. And when that, it's when that is high for too long is kind of like when you get all your issues. So it's like, let's not force cortisol down. It's doing its job. It's protecting you. It's saving you. Why is it high in the first place? Same with the glucose disposal agent. Same with the estrogen blockers. It's like, you've got to look and find out because all your body is trying to do is save you, right? You have to find out like it's doing everything for a reason. You just have to find out what that reason is and you have to talk to your body (laughs) yeah and you have to talk to your body in a language that it understands and that's just like for example when you become stressed and I think this is something you wanted to speak about anyway it's like how does your body know that you're safe so your hypothalamus's job is literally to just assess your environment, to assess your blood levels, to assess everything and see if you are in, if you are safe. And if you can communicate to your body in a way that it understands, and that means, and one, one good way to do that is breath work, right? So breathing, if you can inhale for a certain amount of time, if you can exhale for twice the amount of time that you inhale, that is a good communication to your body that you're safe. Because if you're in a situation of danger, you wouldn't be able to do that. You wouldn't have the luxury of time to be able to slow your breathing down. And same with calorie deficits, right? Historically, the only time that we have ever been short on food supply is if like floods, famines and wars, right? So when you are when food is scarce uh and if you uh if your body is aware that food is scarce it's going to do things to protect you or to try and reserve and look after you because it's like we're not getting what we need all right now we're just going to start being a little bit more um, efficient with what we've got because we need to make it last longer if you diet when your when your body believes that food is scarce and if you continue to diet all you're doing is confirming to your body what it thinks it knows is that food is scarce so it's going to do what it can to preserve what it's got so that's why sometimes you do have to start eating at maintenance you do have to let your body know food is available we are safe and you have to do the breath work because it's like okay we are safe like talk to your body in the language that it understands that there was something in there that I really want to talk about and that's the calorie deficit isn't always a calorie deficit in your body like it is it might be on paper but because your body becomes so efficient this is something I learned personally and it's that a food might be like 200 calories but then your body would process it as 300 because it is in a state where it wants to get as much energy as it can from the food like a calorie is what your body you said this yourself you don't eat calories you eat food which is then broken down and then used as energy you will bring it down and extract more energy if your body is in a state where all it wants is energy and i i remember that because i remember reading somewhere where even with like artificial sweeteners and things with like high like that that like high fiber and ugly saccharides blah 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 your body will actually extract a lot more calories from those 
if it is in a stress state, if it is calorie deprived, because it wants to get that energy. So you like, this is why you cannot diet forever. And this is why you teach the importance of periodization. Like, it, yeah, I mean, Luke, I've never heard, I've actually never heard of the that about being able to extract more calories from food than like what it normally would. Um, but I do know that Luke speaks about on um, like you're never really truly in a calorie deficit because you're either using the food that you're eating now or you're using the food that you've eaten previously, which is your stored body fat. Um, and that's where it's like, be cal- like if you're consuming less than you need, your body's going to find what you to make up the balance of what you need from somewhere else. And that would be your fat stores, right? Um, so you're never really in a deficit as such. Your body will find it. But if you aren't giving it enough, uh, how it how it finds what it needs is by reducing what it needs. Um, so that's like where it'll just like dull down some of the resources that it's been giving to other places. And that's where you get like the reds from um, relative energy deficiency syndrome and stuff like that. And that's where you start getting like brain fog and you're not as alert all the time and you, your neck goes down because that's your body like reducing what it needs because it's not getting it from what you're eating it. So it's having to find it from somewhere else and it wants to limit how much it needs to find um so there are times when it's like yeah you probably do need either like a diet break or you need to eat in maintenance um or what you are eating now your body has reduced its energy expenditure or it's um it's it's reduced how much it needs so now you're actually not eating a deficit you're eating it maintain at your new maintenance so let's like eat a little bit more than you normally would let your body know that it's got all the resources available it'll ramp everything back up and then you can make a deficit again from there if that yeah. makes it does, it does. but the thing is here's the thing as we said in ali's podcast walk 50 miles into the woods you need to walk 50 miles out so you've been doing yeah. like if you've been doing the same shit for years you mm. can't just walk it up for like yeah. weeks and be like, I want to go into a fat loss phase. And I think a really good place to kind of sum this up. So it's not going to, I don't know what else, what else do you want to talk about before we like go into the hurry? I think up? that's kind of it. I think we've covered a lot of really good stuff and I haven't eaten today yet. It's 12.35 and I'm starving. It's 1.35 here, but. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, you're yeah. an hour ahead. Yeah. I cannot wait for the daylight savings to end. Before we talk about the importance of health metrics, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the thing that we started on with the self-awareness around calories and food and how tracking your food is not an eating disorder. But the thing is, yeah. if you look at Luke and you look at Zoe, they're two polar opposites in terms of when it comes to how they make their food. But the thing is, Zoe's been doing this for ages. She knows how she needs to eat for her body. And she it's she kind of consciously, unconsciously tracks her food because she's competent at it. And mm. I guess the biggest part that I wanted to have there is the importance of routine, the importance of having the education around that food so that you are like the fact that tracking calories isn't actually you being obsessed or you being disordered. Because yeah. You don't just track calories to lose weight. You track calories for more things than just losing yeah. weight. And it's, do you know what? There's like a couple of points here on that. And one thing, Australian strength coach said it very well. Someone in one of his Q&As once, someone asked him how many calories he eats. And he's like, I have no idea. He goes, I eat. And if I put on weight, I eat a little less. And if I lose weight, I eat a little more. So, and that's literally, it's that simple. But I think the, the, I track maybe twice a year and it's more so just to bring awareness back to what I'm eating. So it's not so mindless. It brings my mind and consciousness towards, like I make more conscious decisions. But I also think it's important to point out that I am also aware of what food, of what signs and symptoms to look out for and how food should make me feel and how food should, um, how I do respond to it. So like, I know when I'm making a poor decision, but I'm consciously making that poor decision and I'm aware of the consequences that are going to come from whether I eat well or if whether I eat poorly. Um, and I can choose whether I want to accept those consequences or not. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to eat whatever the fuck I want today. I know I'm going to feel like shit tomorrow, but I'm going to, I'm that I'm, I'm consciously aware of the consequences and I'm choosing those consequences today. Whereas normally I can be like, I don't, I don't want to feel like shit tomorrow. Or like, I don't want, if I, if I do this for like a month, like I don't want to put on like four or five kilos. So I'm going to choose not to. Whereas it's like, it's you, I'm not burying my head in the sand of what food is doing to me. Whereas I think a lot of people want to do that. They don't want to bring awareness. They don't want to understand the consequences or understand what food does or doesn't 
doesn't do. And so they just bury their head in the sand about it and be like, I don't care. Um, whereas like, I'm not burying my head in the sand with it, but I'm also not becoming like hyper fixated and the, the data isn't driving me. It's just like, at least I know I, I'm making my own decisions and the educated decisions. I want to emphasize the fact that this is why there are levels to nutrition. This is why we both have levels to the way that we approach our food with our clients as well. It's because you don't know how good you can feel until you actually mm. feel it. And yeah. because Zoe mentioned heaps of times about how things make her feel, how the hell can you know how certain foods make you feel when you've been eating Maccas your whole life? McDonald's yeah. people who and they just don't they don't realize that they're actually feeling crappy and you know one thing I notice when I clean my diet up one of the biggest things I notice is that I wake up in the morning feeling really refreshed when I eat a lot of crap um like and I do that I do that when I get really stressed and busy food always falls it's, it's kind of one of the things I'm and I'm actually fortunately in that stage at the moment where I just have zero motivation to make my meal zero motivation to eat a healthy meal I'm just hey, like look, Uber. coaches do it too see yeah yeah like I'm just and but the thing is like I'm aware and I know this isn't a forever thing and I know that I can tidy shit up when I get to a point like I'm 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 consciously choosing this like I'm not I'm not burying my head in the sand about it and hoping that like bad shit's not going to happen but when I do tidy my diet up the biggest thing I notice is like I I feel better in the mornings um and that's and it's just like people don't associate the two like they just think oh I'm tired I had a crap sleep it's like no you've got a crap diet like your Uh, sleep was uh, like fine that 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 point there it's like when clients are feeling really shit and they come to us saying I'm going to get a blood test because I feel like shit I'm like um, the blood test isn't really going to tell us anything new because the fact that you've been stressed out as fuck forever and you're not even dealing yeah. with it and the fact that you're not eating your veggies and the fact that you're not doing all these other things, like we already know the solutions to the problem that you're coming to us with. Like it's, it's, that's yeah. what it actually it's like, is. <laughs> even if you get labs and it tells you something, the solution is still going to be to clean your diet up and exercise a little more. So you might as well just start doing that. The only reason, like I do think labs should be done when you're doing everything right and it's still not, and it's still not kind of sorting itself out. And then you're like, okay, something deep is going on here. Like, what is it? But usually the answer to most things is just to make better decisions with your activity levels, with your exercise, and then with your diet. And obviously there's, like I mentioned earlier, there's a point of diminishing return. Like you can do too much exercise it's just finding that sweet spot, what works for you um, and just not getting like obsessed about it, which is easier said than done. And this is why, this is where it actually becomes as simple as just that with eating better and actually mm-hmm. moving more. But the thing is, I, it, it's, uh, it's until a point and this is going to lead into the ending of the conversation, which is about why health metrics are so important because doing all these things that we've been talking about and actually focusing on getting fitter, getting stronger, eating enough veggies because veggies contain things called potassium and they contain like all these other vitamins and minerals that actually lead, I say actually a lot, but they actually lead to better blood health. They lead to healthier blood pressure. They lead to all these things that your doctor is telling you you have issues with. Like it is really that simple to do the hard thing, but it is the hard thing. It's simple, but hard. Yeah. It's it's sim- yes. Hard. And, and we can't confuse like simple with easy. Um, but I think in terms of like tracking like your health metrics, it gives a quantifiable, indisputable, definitive almost. Whereas for example, when you're stressed, one of the protective mechanisms of stress is to not feel stress because the last thing you want to do is if you're in a, in a moment of what our stress response was historically designed to uh, protect us from was like those instant threats to your life. And if you felt stress in those instances, it would be detrimental to your survival, right? So you have like a mask and usually you don't feel the effects of stress once the stressor has been removed. Um, so you'll often get a lot of people that are like, I'm not stressed, I'm not stressed, I'm not stressed. Um, and then the examples that Luke likes to use is, you know, then you find out that they hate their boss, they're fighting with their husband, their eight-year-old smoking crack, they've got mortgage stress and might worries and financial worries and they, you know, don't like their partner all this sort of stuff and then you're like how can you not be stressed like you anyway and then but if you take your health markers you've you can only manage what you measure 
And it's like, you actually said it earlier when you were talking about one of your clients who came to you for health and he wasn't tracking. And you're like, well, I don't know where to start because I don't know where you are. Taking health metrics and something that you can measure against as you progress gives you a idea of where to start and how you're tracking whether something's working or not. Because if you've got someone that comes to you and is solely focused on the scale weight and the scale weight's not moving, but all their health markers are improving, you know you're heading in the right direction. Whereas if you don't take them, you've got no idea. Like to them, nothing is working. But you could have all these phenomenal things happening and progress is happening in different ways and in different areas. But if you don't know it, like they're going to feel disheartened. Um, so health metrics are really good. Again, it's kind of like it's not subjective because you've just got too many ways that different ways people interpret things. It gives you like a hard and fast quantitative measure. Um, and you can and you can measure against that consistently similar one as you progress. So you also so you know you're not doing more harm than good as well. So you're not driving yourself further into the hole. You're actually kind of digging yourself out of it. That's a perfect way to sum it all up as well, because that that is the topic of the conversation like it it's focusing on more than just weight loss and it's realizing that there is so much more to the picture and if you want to make it easier effortless and something you enjoy it's good to zoom the fuck out and it's good to stop comparing yourself and it's good to stop trying to do everything all at once and it's good to stop comparing yourself from where you are to where you are not so and it's all like look it's all eat and like it's all like I said simple stuff but it's not always easy to implement and I feel like if you are like listening to this and then you're like oh yeah right like I can't like how do you just stop yourself obsessing over the weight how do you just stop yourself obsessing over the scales how do you just like stop you know because all that emotional side to it if people are listening to this and this seems like unattainable and they can't do this you probably should go and talk to someone because you've got some something going on that's stopping you from getting to your goals if you've got the outlook like you're why aren't you able to take it slow why why do you are you obsessed about putting on a little bit of body fat why are you worried about the scale you know why 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 can't you track without becoming obsessed about the numbers and the food like that stuff that probably needs to be addressed because you do want to get to a place where you are happy with yourself but still wanting to become an and I, and I hesitate to use the word better versions of yourself. Like I did that earlier. And I think using the word better implies that what you are right now isn't, it can be improved upon or, I mean, we can always have room for improvement, but it just insinuates that you're not good right now. Everyone is completely fine where they're at and it's not a problem to want to be better or do more. Um, but I just think it shouldn't become to the point where you won't settle with anything less than like phenomenal. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Being okay with where you're at, but wanting a better version of yourself. Hmm. So that's actually really, that's, that's a really good way to end it. I don't even know what to call this podcast now. I'm going to have to like split it up and see what's going on. big mishmash of everything. Yeah. It really is. And it goes to show that there is so much more underneath the surface of how you eat, what you eat, how you train and what you do in the gym, because Hmm. we're humans. We're not robots. And another thing just really quickly to touch on that I jotted down before is, um, you know, you can really set the, put someone in the right environment, they can create the right habits, but if they don't change their mindset or beliefs around stuff, they still won't ever get to where they want to go or, or be happy with where they are. So people really need to um, work on their perception of themselves <laughs> uh, and that will help them. Cause yeah, it's just like I said, if, if you focus on shit through a straw, you kind of miss everything else and you can set someone up with the right habits, but if they're approaching it from the wrong mindset or the wrong perspective or the wrong point of view, then it's not, it's, probably going to do more damage than good in the long run anyway that is that actually is a perfect way to end it because i have a tweet on that as well it, Amazing. You you, like you cannot the, you know the saying there is actually a saying there that's like you cannot fix a problem winston churchill churchill winston you cannot solve a problem with the same mindset that created it it's yep. the same thing 100 percent. yep that's exactly spot on yeah so with that thank you for the chat thank you for coming on mama muscle nerd (laughs) (laughs) if you liked this make sure you actually go and check out muscle nerds page because that it like you will see why there is so much more to this and what meets the eye and it will give you such a big reality check for what really constitutes health and fitness and your dream body and how it really is not as complex nor as simple as it seems. It's 
it's what you make of it and what you are willing and able to do. So with that, thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Bye, guys. Oh.